Unit 10. Track 35. Speaker 1. Nowadays, everyone's suddenly jumping on the ecological bandwagon and talking about sustainable living. But really, my walking to the shops instead of driving is hardly going to make much difference, is it? I find it easy enough to do, but I suspect all it achieves is to make me feel virtuous. People think concern about the environment is something new, but when I was a child, we used to get told off if we left a light on when we went out of a room, and wearing your elder brother's or sister's handed down clothes to save money was just a fact of life. You didn't expect to have new clothes until you were an adult. Speaker 2 I suppose most people have one thing that they really try hard with. I can remember my mum and dad being obsessed with water. They saved water from the kitchen for the pot plant as long as it didn't have detergent in it. They also attached water butts to the drain pipes around our house to collect rainwater for the garden. That's had quite a powerful influence on me, because they still seem like natural things to do. I wish I could get the rest of my family to do the same, though. They just laugh at me and refuse. Yet they're all very concerned about not wasting food. It's illogical, really. Speaker 3 Where I live, the council can recycle certain materials, but in other districts they do far more. It's really annoying. I've contacted the council a couple of times about it, but they say they haven't got the facilities to recycle anything else. My target is to only buy things in packaging that can be reused, like cardboard, but it isn't easy. And of course, we produce so much more waste these days. When I was young, we didn't have much money to spend, so a lot of my clothes were homemade. I remember my mother knitted me itchy pullovers that didn't fit. When they wore thin, they were patched and patched again. It was pretty embarrassing, I can tell you. Speaker 4 I travel by train rather than car whenever possible, and I haven't flown for years. But it's surprising how many other people regard me as eccentric, which makes me feel uncomfortable. So, to avoid awkward situations, I don't mention it. I say, I don't like flying, or I prefer looking out of a train window. I wouldn't try to change people's minds. My concern about the environment came from my parents. I can remember everything organic from the kitchen got composted. It was the only household chore I enjoyed doing. Taking potato peelings, eggshells, coffee grounds and so on out to the compost bin in the garden. It made excellent fertiliser for the plants. Speaker 5 When I was a teenager, I wanted to start buying makeup, but my parents wouldn't let me. As a joke, my father said, why didn't I make my own? I decided to take him seriously and rubbed beetroot juice into my lips to make them pink. I was very excited the first time I went out like that, and my friends thought I looked great. I do a lot more for the environment now, like cycling instead of driving a car, but it has an impact on my children. They'd love to go ice skating, but the only way to get to the nearest skating rink is by car, so it's impossible. Track 36 Dave We love free cycle. My girlfriend Helen enforces a policy of household recycling as much as possible and it was her idea to join because we were about to move in together and had a lot of stuff lying around that was doubled up. We've also used the site to help furnish our new flat. We had absolutely no furniture so it was a big challenge for us. But our free cycle group seemed to offer everything we needed from three-piece suites to the kitchen sink. After bagging some great stuff in the first few weeks we were completely hooked. We managed to wangle a bathroom cabinet, a set of bookshelves, a laundry basket and loads of kitchen utensils and crockery. Helen seemed to have more success at claiming things than I did. Maybe it was the female touch, or maybe it was the sheer speed of her email responses. I don't know. I have shifted, among other things, an old chair, some speakers and Helen's old curling tongs. It is so much more rewarding to have people pick up the goods from you than just putting things in the bin. 
The pinnacle of our free cycle success has got to be claiming a huge shelving unit and a lovely sofa. Helen then requested a sewing machine, which she used to make a cover for the new sofa. We've been able to put other people's unwanted but perfectly good furniture to new use. It's also made the cost of decorating an entire flat far easier to stomach. I'm now offering a lot more stuff on the site. I'm well and truly converted and use it more than Helen. I check the site all the time for new offers. Come summer, I'd love a garden table and chairs. Julia I found out about FreeCycle when my colleague posted up loads of our ancient office furniture that would have been dumped otherwise. I've been hooked since. When I drive past the dump, the amount of wonderful stuff I see that's going to waste seems criminal. I'm tempted to give out flyers for free cycle when I go past, to tell people they don't have to throw good things away. There are three main benefits to free cycle. First, people can get things for free. I've got a massive list of things I'm really happy with. Shower doors, a sewing machine, a farm gate, a china umbrella stand. I've actually taken more than I've been able to give. Second, people usually post up stuff that they think isn't worth selling, which makes free cycle good for avoiding landfill. Third, people come and collect what you've advertised, so it's very convenient for you. I once offered a broken lawn mower, which somebody snapped up. Free cycle in Oxford has quite strict guidelines because everything on the forum should be stuff that could end up on the dump otherwise. People accept the rules, but they also love the community feel of the group. So, in order to avoid clogging up the Free Cycle Forum, a subgroup has been set up called the Oxford Free Cycle Café. The café's more chatty, and people offer all kinds of things on it, such as wind-fallen apples or spare firewood, it really shows the demand for free community networks. Anna My partner and I moved to a small holding here just over a year ago with the aim of setting up a more sustainable lifestyle. We provide for ourselves by growing produce, raising and eating our own poultry and meat, and using our own fuel. We found out about our local free cycle group from an article in our daily newspaper, recycled for composting and fire lighting, and its philosophy seemed to go hand in hand with our own, so we thought there would be no better way of offloading some of the excess chicks we had at the time. We instantly got involved with this wonderful system of free exchange and have since taken many items that have been incredibly useful. Since we started out, we found homes for two cockroaches, and we took someone's vacuum cleaner, which is now in my son's flat, and we've given away some lovely eggs for sale signs written on slate. One of the great things about Free Cycle is that you can choose whom to give things to. You're encouraged to give items to charities if they request it, but otherwise choosing a recipient is entirely up to you, and no explanations are necessary. In our free cycle group, there are the usual postings for items like sofas, TVs, computers and cots, all of which are extremely useful to members. But there are also postings which probably wouldn't be found in groups in cities. Requests to rehouse dogs, geese, a sow and her piglets and sheep. These latter items reflect the fact that here Free Cycle has become a real aid to those of us who value the idea of sustainability while being part of the farming community. Unit 11. Track 37. As you may know, there's an international classification system for household spending called the Classification of Individual Consumption by Purpose. If we look at the figures for household expenditure in the UK in 2011, average weekly expenditure was £483.60, a rise of £10 from 2010's £473.60. Total expenditure generally increases from year to year, partly because of inflation and partly because incomes tend to rise. However, 
the 2009 figure of £455 was in fact lower than in 2008. If we now break down that total into categories, the highest area of spending in 2011 was transport, which accounted for £65.70 a week. Most of that was related to purchasing and running cars and other vehicles, with only £10.20 a week being spent on public transport. Slightly less, £63.90, in fact, was spent on recreation and culture, which was the second largest category. Just under £19 of that was spent on package holidays, mostly holidays abroad, while the remaining £45.10 went on computers, TVs and other leisure activities. Track 38 The credit card is a 20th century invention, but the concept of credit goes back over 3,000 years. Basically, it means providing somebody with money or goods and trusting them to repay or return those resources at some later date. It's sometimes said that before the emergence of money, the earliest farming communities exchanged goods or services in a barter system. It now seems more likely that a form of credit called a gift economy was in operation, where people helped others without receiving anything in exchange. Instead, there was an expectation that if they later needed help, they would get it. The earliest records of a form of credit date back to around 1300 BC, among the Babylonians and Assyrians of present-day Iraq. And by 1000 BC, the Babylonians had devised a system of credit that simplified payments in trade between distant places. A merchant who bought from one supplier might be asked to pay a third party who had given the supplier credit. In ancient Egypt, grain functioned as both food and money and was stored in granaries, whose administration was effectively a government bank. This became a trade credit system, with payments transferred between accounts without money changing hands. Egyptians also sold real estate, with payment being made in instalments. The vast area of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago encouraged widespread trading and the use of credit, particularly among traders on the shores of the Mediterranean. Then, as the empire declined and transferring money became both dangerous and difficult, credit was widely used to get round the problems. During the Middle Ages, from about 500 to 1500 AD, credit was essential to the trading activities of the prosperous Italian city-states. Lending and borrowing as well as buying and selling on credit became commonplace among all social classes, from peasants to nobles. In a common form of investment and credit, especially in Italy, a capitalist might help to finance a merchant's trading expedition and share the risk. If the voyage was a success, the creditor recovered his investment plus a large bonus. However, if the ship was lost, the creditor could lose his entire investment. Trading centres of the Middle Ages held fairs at regular intervals, and here another form of credit developed. A merchant, who was short of cash, could secure goods on credit by writing a letter promising to pay on a certain date. Before repaying the money, he had time either to sell the goods he'd brought with him, or to take home and sell the goods that he'd purchased on credit. The first English settlers in North America in the early 17th century used credit to finance their voyage. Before they set sail, negotiations to raise the funds they needed lasted for three years. A wealthy London merchant organised a group of investors to finance the trip. Although these investors were supposed to be repaid in seven years, it was 25 years before they received their money in full. Now I'll go on. Track 39 some people say that having any job is better than no job at all. What do you think? Well, I think it depends on the kind of job we're talking about and the kind of person you are. A university graduate, for instance, would not want to clean the streets for a living. I mean, he'd expect something better than that. Yes, but if there was no other job available, what then? Would you rather be unemployed? I think I would try to create a job for myself. Now, with the internet, an imaginative person can find a way to earn a living. I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Perhaps you can do that, but it's not always so easy. For me, 
I would find it frustrating to be unemployed, so I think I would get a job cleaning rather than not work at all. I hate sitting around doing nothing. I think there are certain jobs I would find it embarrassing to do, so I cannot say the same for me. Also, if you are looking for a specific career, you need to be available for interviews, etc. So, remaining unemployed until you find what you are looking for is not always bad. Maybe, but that becomes a problem when you're out of work for six months. I think a potential employer will be more impressed by someone who shows a general willingness to work. Yes, but... Thank you. That is the end of the test. Unit 12. Track 40. A. I think it's time Roger retired. Yes, well, quite. B. Gillian is quite a little troublemaker, isn't she? C. I think it's quite a good idea to take her advice. D. It's quite clear to me that you weren't listening. E. After the accident, he was never quite the same. F. I thought the script was quite ridiculous. Track 41. Extract 1. So, Richard, tell us about what got you started as an independent filmmaker. From an early age, I was obsessive about film, um, about directing and cinematography, but it never occurred to me that I could do it myself until one day I picked up my dad's 8mm camera and started recording family life. I used to watch films all the time, too. Uh, my local video shop had a section of unclassifiable films that didn't belong in any section, and these were all my favourite films. Mm. Uh, they were totally unique. Uh, they made up their own rules, and they always left me feeling as if something inside me had changed. Uh, these films proved that the medium of film had the power uh, to change someone's perception of the world, and that just made me more determined. And yet you claim that you don't make arty films. Uh, while I knew I wanted to work in this genre, um, I also knew how easy it was for experimental films to turn into pretentious rubbish. Um, I wanted to express my message through film using abstraction and music, but not some over-the-top art piece. Uh, I'm just not interested in art films where I watch ten minutes and know what's going to happen in the next hour. Extract 2 I went to see the latest Narnia film last night. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. What was it like? It's got great special effects and everything, but you know how sometimes an adaptation brings a book to life and you think, this is exactly right? Well, this one couldn't have been more different from my childhood memory of it. I sat there getting more and more annoyed. But that reminded me of why I loved the book in the first place, so as soon as I got home, I went and dug out my old copy and started reading it again. And did you enjoy it? Oh, I certainly did. I just don't think I'll ever be satisfied by an adaptation. I'm sure they're made with the best intentions, but every time I read good reviews and go and see one, I'm disappointed. With books I grew up with, I feel I inhabit them. Every character and every scene means something very specific to me, and I don't want the film to interfere with that. Hmm... Obviously, there's an audience for these films, though, and if they introduce the book to some people who don't know it, that can't be bad. Absolutely. Extract 3. I think it's depressing. The women film directors are in such a tiny minority. There are some that have done well commercially, like Jane Campion with her film The Piano, or Gorinda Charter's Bended Like Beckham, and Nora Ephron. She had several big successes, like Sleepless in Seattle. But really, how many films can you actually think of that were directed by women? I'm sure that if this imbalance were to occur in any other profession, there'd be a major outcry. Why is it that filmmaking continues to be the most unbalanced career in the arts? Well, obviously, there are the difficulties of working in a male-dominated industry. Women need role models like the two women you just mentioned. And if they're raising children, they may not be able to make the most of the opportunities that present themselves. And there's no easy solution to that. But the truth is that, whether you're male or female, it's really hard to make films. 
Creativity is stifled because filmmakers have to spend far too much time fundraising, and women are not generally used to asking for money. It seems to come more easily to men. Track forty-two. Speaker one. Well, it's about a pirate, Jack Sparrow, played by Johnny Depp, who used to be captain of a ship called the Black Pearl. But now that ship's been commandeered by a zombie pirate called Captain Barboza. He has been cursed with living death until he can find the living heir of old Bootstrap Bill Turner, who is actually played by Orlando Bloom. And to that end, he has kidnapped the beautiful Elizabeth Swan. Speaker two. It's an animated film about an ogre who lives in a swamp. Coming home one day, he finds that all these fairy tale characters have moved in, which he's not very happy about, to say the least. Accompanied by a talking donkey that irritates him greatly, he sets off on a fairy tale adventure of his own and comes face to face with dragons, princesses, and even happy endings. Speaker three. It's a musical, actually. And it's about two brothers, Jake and Elwood, who were on a mission from God to save a convent orphanage from closure. In order to legitimately raise the money they need, they have to put their old blues band back together. No mean feat in itself, uh, despite the fact that the police and all their old enemies are all in hot pursuit. What I love is the wonderful performances by John Lee Hooker, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, to name but a few. Speaker four. The film is based on an actual historical event, of course, but the main story is a romance told in flashback by the old woman Rose, remembering Jack, whom she met on board the ship for the first time. He is a penniless artist who won his ticket to America in a game of cards. She is an attractive young lady engaged to marry a wealthy aristocrat to pay off her family's debts. Speaker five. I love this film, even though it's quite spooky, really. I think the actor who plays the scared little boy with psychic abilities is excellent, and Bruce Willis is great as the failed child psychologist who wants to make sure he gets it right second time around. You really need to see it twice because only then do you really appreciate all the details leading to the final twist. Unit thirteen. Track forty-three. Now I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some different methods of advertising a product or service. Talk to each other about how effective these different methods might be for advertising a new language school. Yes, well, I think the billboard is a very effective way of advertising, as it can be seen by everyone in the area. Also, people are not so angry at seeing billboards. Whereas they get annoyed when people push leaflets under their door. Do you agree, Magda? Yes, you're right. They don't like leaflets. Um, not at all. I know. I usually throw leaflets away without looking at them, but I think it depends on what product you want to advertise. Leaflets might be a good idea for a new language school, because you can include information on courses and photos of the classrooms and facilities in the school. And a bold advert in the local newspaper is a good idea, as most people read the newspaper, and so they will see it. But I still think the billboard is the best idea, don't you? Yes, I agree with you. It will be seen by the largest number of people, and so will be most effective. Um, that's all. Track forty-four, speaker one. Communication seems to be absolutely non-stop these days. You can even receive emails and text messages in the middle of the night. But though the quantity is increasing, quality seems to be going downhill. At least we were more careful when we used a pen or typewriter for letters, because changing anything could look a mess. So they were much more accurate. It was while I was discussing this with a friend that we came up with the idea of setting up a training firm. We know there's a demand for training in all types of communication skills, so potentially it could be very profitable. And we've both got a lot of relevant experience. 
Speaker 2. What I find fascinating is how delicate a tool language is. You can express tiny nuances of meaning through the choice of words, or, in speech, your intonation, or by putting in a pause. It's such a pleasure to listen to someone who has really good communication skills. Some stand-up comics, for example, and one or two people I've heard giving presentations. I've decided to develop this interest of mine further by writing a series of children's books. This will involve quite a lot of work. First, I'll enrol on a creative writing course and improve what I've already produced. And during the course, I intend to contact several publishers to find out how best to get my work published. Speaker 3 The organisation I belong to monitors the press, TV and radio, and our aim is to challenge anything that we consider harmful to children. And believe me, there's a great deal that worries us, particularly some of the things that are shown as acceptable behaviour for children. We want to make journalists think carefully about the potential effects of what they write on young readers. Now, we're all volunteers, so our work is unpaid. However, we have numerous expenses, not least of which is the cost of postage on letters. So I'm here today to ask for your financial assistance. Even a small contribution from each of you would be greatly appreciated and will be put to good use. Speaker 4 We've had a lot of feedback from the public pointing out mistakes in the information sheets and leaflets we produce. Most of them contain grammatical mistakes or spelling errors, or don't make the meaning clear. And there's really no excuse. It harms the image of the whole organisation. And anyway, what's the point of having information sheets that aren't fit for purpose? So, could each of you try to set aside some time to look through the materials you've produced yourself and classify them as being fine as they are, needing some quick and easy improvement, or requiring a major rewrite. It would certainly help us to improve our materials. Speaker 5 We have quite a few communication difficulties at work, with clashes between people that can get out of control. One of the other managers, Stephen, is very good at handling that sort of thing. When it happens, he chats to each person individually to find out how they see what's going on and usually he can diffuse the situation before it gets too serious. And I try to learn from him. So I really don't think there's any need to worry about Stephen's style of management. He always encourages people to make up their own minds and to play an active role in the running of the department. I think that's far more effective than giving orders to everyone. Unit 14. Track 45. The earliest multi-celled animals might have been sponges, which, although they look like plants, are actually animals. They most likely appeared around 700 million years ago. Invertebrates, which are the first animals that could get around, such as flatworms and jellyfish, are believed to have evolved around 570 million years ago. And then, about 500 million years ago, vertebrates, the group which includes fish and other animals with a backbone, suddenly appeared. About 470 million years ago, the first plants began to grow out of the water. And this is when life on land established itself. Insects originally appeared on land about 380 million years ago and were followed relatively soon after that by the first amphibians, which surfaced from the water to become land animals approximately 350 million years ago. Essentially, they were fish that evolved lungs to breathe air. They employed their fins to crawl from one pond to another, and these gradually became legs. The next group to emerge, about 300 million years ago, were the reptiles. For the next 50 million years, life on Earth prospered. But about 250 million years ago, the Earth experienced a period of mass extinction, which meant that many species disappeared. Around this time, one group of reptiles called dinosaurs started to dominate all others. Their name means terrible lizard, 
They were the commonest vertebrates, and they controlled the Earth for the next 150 million years. Throughout this time, a new type of animal began to evolve. These animals were the mammals. They gave birth to live young, which they nourished with milk from their bodies, and they first appeared about 200 million years ago. The closest living family to the dinosaurs is believed to be birds. The first known bird, Archaeopteryx, appeared about 150 million years ago. It existed for around 70 million years before becoming extinct, and was replaced by the group which includes modern birds, believed to have appeared around 60 million years ago, at the same time that the dinosaurs became extinct. The group of mammals to which humans belong, the primates, emerged from an ancestral group of animals that ate mainly insects around 50 million years ago. But it wasn't until about 3 million years ago, about the time the last ice age started, that intelligent apes with the ability to walk on their back legs appeared in southern Africa. Simultaneously, their brains evolved, and they learnt to make and use tools. Although called Homo habilis, meaning handyman, these creatures were more like apes than men. About two million years ago, Homo habilis evolved into the first people called Homo erectus. Their bodies were like ours, but their faces were still ape-like. They evolved in Africa and spread as far as Southeast Asia. Modern people, Homo sapiens, appear to have evolved in Africa about 100,000 years ago, although the date is far from certain. Track 46 We all take for granted the air we breathe and the oxygen essential for our survival. But the Earth's atmosphere didn't always contain oxygen. In fact, for most of its history, there wasn't really any oxygen in the air at all. It's only been during the last 600 million years that there's been enough to support life, which, as it happens, is how long there has been life on land. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere has swung wildly between tiny amounts, as little as 12% compared to today's 21%, to huge proportions, up to 30% during one particular period. This variation has, of course, had a massive impact on the animals living on Earth at any particular time. Animals have either taken advantage of the sudden increases in oxygen in order to evolve and colonize the land, or they have faced being made extinct during the periods when oxygen was scarce. Paleontologists have always had an interest in the occurrences that may have caused species to become extinct. The leading causes have been identified as meteors, ice ages, climate change and so on, but fascinatingly enough, it's now clear that each mass extinction on Earth coincided with times of reduced oxygen. These periods have usually been followed by bursts of much higher oxygen levels, which again have coincided with the time of incredibly fast evolution in animal species. In most cases, it appears that the most successful animals to inhabit the land during these times were those that developed more advanced respiratory systems. For example, invertebrates appeared on land for the first time around 420 million years ago, at a time when oxygen levels were higher than today's. Yet soon after that, approximately 400 million years ago, oxygen levels suddenly fell dramatically, and most of these animals disappeared, either becoming extinct or returning to the ocean. Oxygen levels didn't increase again for another 50 million years or so, during which time only a small number of animals could survive on land. Then, 350 million years ago, oxygen levels started to rise, reaching their highest ever levels around 280 to 300 million years ago. This is when reptiles appeared, and they thrived in this rich atmosphere. But, as oxygen levels started to fall once more over the next 50 million years, animals had to make some swift adjustments, or they suffocated for lack of air. The animals that adjusted most efficiently were the dinosaurs. What they did was to add another pair of air sacs next to the lungs. This enabled them to extract even greater amounts of oxygen from the thinning air. Because of this evolutionary adaptation, it appears that they were the only animals that managed to do well during the mass extinction of 200 million years ago, 
the time with the lowest recorded oxygen levels. We can still see these air sac adaptations in their descendants today, the birds, and it's actually this which then allows some birds to fly at altitudes with little oxygen. Track 47 Now, I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some of the ecological issues that need attention. First, you have some time to look at the task. Now, talk to each other about how serious each of these issues is. OK. Well, at first glance, I would say that deforestation is probably the most important ecological issue. What do you think? Yes, I agree. These forests are important because they're the home to so many species of animals and plants. If they're all cut down, it'll cause lots of problems. Yes, and the forests also affect the weather and the air's temperature, I think, don't they? However, we shouldn't ignore the issue of pollution. That's another very serious issue. Yes, you're quite right. Pollution is dangerous for our health and it's also dangerous to wildlife. Some species may disappear forever because their habitats have been destroyed by pollution. On the other hand, the extinction of species is a very serious issue. I've read that if we don't do something now, over half the Earth's species could be extinct in the next hundred years. Yes, and that's a frightening idea. Thank you. Now you have about a minute to decide which is the most serious issue. I don't know about you, Giovanni, but taking everything into consideration, it seems to me that climate change is the most urgent issue. Why do you think that? Well, if the world's temperature rises by even a couple of degrees, it'll almost certainly have a catastrophic effect on nearly everything. For example, if the Greenland ice cap melts, sea level will rise, causing flooding in lots of places around the world. That's true. And of course, that would destroy a lot of habitats, possibly resulting in the loss of species living there. Yes, I would agree with you. Thank you. Can I have the booklet, please?